Hello for everyone that's coming in right now. It is just now the top of the hour. So I'm going to wait about two more minutes and then we will go ahead and get started. So if you need to do something real quick, uh, feel free. You have about two minutes and then we'll get rolling. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I just want to welcome everyone to the Deadlift Like a Champion webinar or Strength Talk, as we call them here. And thank you for joining us. Deeply appreciate your attention and support. And we aim to have a great Deadlift session for you. All right, that being said, real quick, just some administrative items for you relative to the webinar. First off, there will be no sound or sight on your side. That's just to eliminate confusion and having lots of different noises and or visuals going on while the webinar is happening. The other thing is, if you have a question, there should be, you'll see a control panel, especially if you're on a computer, there'll be a control panel that has a lot of different tabs. The question tab is where you can ask questions. And as I will be the only one on this webinar today, uh, our tactical training manager, he is busy, so he won't be with us right now. Uh, that's Patrick Warmel, who is a fantastic educator, but he won't be with us right now, and I'll be going through the webinar, discussing it, and I will be eyeing the question box, so if you do have questions, feel free to ask. I want to leave time at the very end so we can address some of those questions and I can run through them. Um, I plan to get through this in a timely fashion, so we should have a good 15 minutes or so at the end of this to discuss and talk about some questions should you have them. The other thing is I'll have some polls as we get started, and I'm actually going to give you one right now. Just to help me out as we go through this, I'd like to know a little bit about you so I know how to best address what we're talking about more specifically, especially when questions start to come through. So the first poll I have for you is of these specific items, which one best represents who you are? Are you a strength conditioning coach, personal trainer? Are you an athlete, fitness enthusiast, owner, operator, or other, such as any type of licensed professional, whether it's massage, physio, chiro, et cetera? So go ahead and just jump in on that. Thank you guys for answering that in a timely fashion. That's fantastic. It's good to see. Awesome. Okay, we have a lot of fitness enthusiasts, and a fair number of athletes and strength coaches, personal trainers. Excellent. So I'll leave that open for just a second. Beautiful. So it looks like we have predominantly a lot of fitness enthusiasts here, but we do have a variety of, of others. So I will try to address those. And again, as you have questions, um, please feel free to uh, make it specific to you. And that way I can answer things that may be a little bit more specific to who you are. Okay, thank you so much for that. The last poll I want to do before we get going is I just want to know if this is your first Alekal Strength Talk, a real simple yes or no one for me. And that just helps me know if 
you've seen some of these before or if you haven't. Okay, fantastic. So about two thirds of you have been on this before. So thank you for rejoining us. We deeply appreciate your continued support. Those of you that are new, uh, I'll just take a real quick second to introduce myself. I'm Rodney Korn. I'm the Director of Education here at Alenco. I'm based in the USA. Our headquarters is in Austin, Texas. I live in Northern California, so I remotely work and I'll commute back and forth at times for different events like the IPF World Championships that we're having, the Bench Press World Championships in Austin, which by the way is setting a record for the most attendees, over 1,200 athletes are gonna be there. So that's gonna be fantastic. Um, I've been in the industry for 25, been in the industry 35 years, 25 as an educator. So I've been doing this a long time. I've been with the Lego now just about five years. So it's been a total treat and pleasure to be here. So I'm really excited. So why don't we jump in and we'll get started. Okay, so as we go through this, uh, I'm gonna break it down and we're gonna start. Uh, first, I'm gonna get into some of the benefits that we have with deadlifts. So people are just aware that there are some benefits and it's pretty interesting what the benefits actually are. So what we found um, from a research standpoint is that number one, deadlifts have been shown to increase the rate of torque or force development. And the RFD or the rate of force development is deemed as one of the most important factors for athletic performance. It's how fast you can access and generate force uh, which turns into power, even though power lifting is, can be technically more of a strength lifting, uh, it does produce the qualities that are necessary for power. And that's been turned into and shown to increase vertical jump height. And sometimes that's where people get thrown off is that you don't necessarily have to train totally specific to a vertical jump in order to increase or to a specific event in order to increase the physiological parameters necessary to enhance that event. And so by increasing the rate of torque or the rate of force production, we can then increase vertical jump because that's part of what a vertical jump is all about. On the other side of the coin, from more of a physiotherapy standpoint, deadlifts have been shown to be just as effective as any form of physical therapy, traditional physical therapy uh, treatments for increasing the thickness or hypertrophy, as well as the symmetry of the, some of the lumbar stabilizing muscles, stabilizing muscles, and specifically the multifidi or the multifidus muscles, which have been uh, shown in research. These are smaller muscles that stabilize each segment of the spine, especially in the lower back. And the, 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 the hypertrophy is vitally important, but it's the symmetry that becomes extremely important. And that's why doing a deadlift with proper form can have a tremendous impact on these deep stabilizing muscles, which can be great for actually the prevention of low back pain. So many people associate the deadlift with, well, it's gonna increase back pain and you're gonna have a high risk of getting injured. Actually, it's, it's just the opposite. If you do these correctly, you increase your ability to not have back pain, but it's one, do you do a lift correctly? And two, it definitely comes down to programming. How are you programming? And what are you doing with your program strategies? We won't be talking in detail about programming strategies. We're gonna talk more about the deadlift and its technique. So let's jump into some of the technique. At Aleco, we have an actual performance system that we use for any type of lifting. Those of you that saw the weightlifting, the Olympic weightlifting we did, probably saw something very similar to this, but it was specific to the Olympic lifts. This is gonna be more specific to powerlifting, but for this, it's gonna be specifically the deadlift. <clears throat> so in our setup, we have the equipment position in action. We know the equipment we're gonna be talking about is the barbell, unless we're gonna look focus on, but you can do deadlifts with other pieces of equipment. You don't have to have just a barbell. You can use a landmine, you can use a kettlebell, you can use a dumbbell. The technique is very, very similar, and as we'll talk about, but the equipment can be different. But then there goes down to the positioning, and so we're going to focus right now on the positioning. We'll get to the action in a second. 
But the positioning is everything that you're doing prior to actually lifting the bar off the ground and the deadlift. And that's gonna include what we call stance, grip, your body bar relationship, and then the tension. And within stance and grip, we have what types of widths and angles are we gonna be using for the hands and the feet because there are differences and there are different preferences. So the importance with your positioning, because it's the setup, is this is where you actually establish, create and establish the balance and stability, which will then enhance the leverage that you're gonna to need to actually lift the loads. So setup has an absolute purpose. You're trying to get stable and balanced. Every lift, you have to be balanced because if you're off balance, especially depending on the load you're using, then you have an opportunity for a poor lifting or poor lifting technique. And then better stability, better balance creates better leverage because you get yourself into a better mechanical position. So we're gonna go through and we're gonna talk about body bar relationship, stance, grip, and then the tension. So when we look at body bar relationship, this is an absolute key. This is how the body is going to be relative to the bar and vice versa. Because anytime you're lifting with a bar, you're basically dancing with that. And I said that in the Olympic weightlifting that we did, is that it's a dance. The power lifts are the same. You're still dancing with the bar, meaning you have to move with the bar and you have to make sure that the bar is moving where you want it to move in order to have a successful lift or proper technique. So when we look at general parameters for the body bar relationships, let's start with first off, there are two different styles of deadlifts that can be done. So you need to know is it going to be a conventional, which is the top one, and then it's, or it's going to be the sumo. So you can, we all have seen that probably someone does a variation or a form of one of these. So the conventional is just a little bit more narrow stance, depending on your size and your limb, and that's all going to change. So all of these are just generalities, and it can change based upon the person and their limb structure, ratios, etc. And the hands will be outside of the thighs or legs in a conventional. With the sumo, the legs are going to be wider with the hands inside. <laughs> So when we're talking about body bar relationship, depending on which one you, you are going to use, which style, the bar and the body are going to, or the body's going to sit a little differently relative to the bar, depending on, uh, like I said, which lift you're going to use. And typically in the sumo, there's a little bit more of a, a raised trunk uh, relative to the conventional. So the trunks may be different. Now, this will be dependent upon the person's body type. So because of the way my body is situated, you'll see in some of the videos that there's not a whole lot of difference between my positioning depending on whether I'm sumo or whether I'm in conventional. So some people may have to adjust the bar. That's going to go down into your mobility as well as your limb lengths. So those things all come into factor. We're going to talk a little bit about that. All right, so number one, style of what you're gonna do, conventional or sumo. The next one is the bar placement relative to the feet. So your, the bar is gonna be right over the top of your feet and it's gonna be very close to the shin. You don't necessarily wanna scrape it up your shin, though that's going to happen inadvertently because that creates more friction. But you don't wanna to be too far away because then that creates a decreased mechanical advantage. So in general, it's right over the top of the foot, kind of where the tongue, the foot meets the the, the shin right over the tongue of the shoe or the slipper or whatever you may have. The shin, knee, hip, trunk position, as you can see on the, the images on the left-hand side, it's going to be more of a zigzag. So in essence, the shins are going to be slightly inclined, and that's going to vary. The inclination will, will vary depending upon, again, limb length, the person, uh, and their mobility, what they're capable of, and how much dorsal flexion they're going to use or not use. So the, the shins are going to be slightly inclined towards the bar. Then you're going to have your knees are going to be lower than the hips, so the hips are going to be higher than the knees. And then that trunk, you want to maintain a neutral to slightly extended spine. And then the shoulders are going to be higher than the hips, obviously. So that's the zigzag positioning that you're going to look at right there. Now you saw that I say a slightly extended, and one of the things I just want to bring up is a slightly extended neck 
positioning will actually help the mid back and thoracic spine remain in an extended position with the chest up and out. A lot of times people will drop their head and as you drop your head, we you know from research, if you drop your head, you actually change and you put your, your thoracic spine into flexion, whether you know it or not. And that also has ramifications down the spine. Remember your spine is all connected. So there's natural curves. So I have a natural lordotic curve or extension in the neck. And then I have a rounding, a natural rounding in the thoracic spine. And then I have a natural curve in my low back again. So as I change the neck, I increase the, if I flex the neck, I increase the vertebrae flexing in the thoracic spine, which will also give the propensity for the low back to flex. And that's through mechanics and research uh, relative to spinal mechanics. So by keeping the neck in a little bit more of an extended position, as you see in this picture, that actually helps the thoracic spine stay in a much more, it is slightly extended, which helps you keep your chest out, which prevents you from collapsing. Now, one of the biggest things that will happen, you'll see people immediately collapse, especially when they get into really heavy weight or heavier weight. Uh, and that's a programming issue too, because a lot of people don't progress the whole body in a power lift. They're just going for how much weight can they lift but they're not focused on the technique to build that foundation as they increase their lift. So you'll notice that great power lifters, they work lots of back, they work lots of pulling movements, they work lots of positioning because you have to have that foundation if you're going to lift heavier. So just a little tip, that head position, that neck position is vital when you get into the rest of it. And yes, you have to work on the rest and make sure that you understand how to position your low back but that would be a key that a lot of people forget about. So just a little tip. And then the bar placement relative to the shoulder. This will be really important. And sometimes you may wanna, this is what I would suggest having either having someone videotape or at least take some pictures or yourself to set it up with all the, the contraptions we have nowadays. So you can see where your shoulders are relative to the bar. Cause if you're too far forward, if you're, your, your, your shoulders are too far forward over the bar or too far back, that decreases your mechanical advantage and it changes how the, the body is going to be placed in stress or what areas are gonna be placed more stress on. And you wanna lift that bar straight up and not have to get too many angles involved in the bar, uh, especially coming off the floor. So make sure that there's a, between your shoulder and the bar, it's essentially a straight line. All right, from the stance, this is gonna involve foot width and toe angle. When we look at the foot width and toe angle, that's going to depend on obviously what style of deadlift that you're going to do. And there's a lot, there's a there's a debate because you have some people that say you have to do sumo if you're going to lift heavy, and there's other people that say no, that's not true. Um, I'm of the people who say that that's not true. You don't have to lift sumo to lift heavy. Um, Part of the rationale behind the sumo, which mechanically makes sense, is that you have less distance to travel if your feet are wider because the, you're closer to the ground and the bar doesn't have to go as high. That's great. However, when you change the positioning of the body, you change how the musculature will work. So you're putting muscles in different positions, which means if you're not capable of doing it because of one, either your mobility, two, your strength, and or three, just your overall general makeup and structure, then that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna lift more. Yes, it is a shorter distance, but you might be weaker. So it cancels each other out. So how do we find which one is going to be best for someone or which one should we be starting at in order to do that? Well, you can use mobility assessments and then it ultimately will come down to feeling preference. And I highly recommend, as we do at the Lego, and we teach this, this is part of the courses that we teach, is let's, let's see where the person actually fits best. So from a mobility assessment, we can use integrated and isolated mobility assessments to help provide us with a little bit better overall picture of what the person is capable of or what I'm capable of. You as a fitness enthusiast, what are you capable of? So you can take yourself through some of these mobility exams. And by the way, all the stuff that we're talking about, and this actually is an online course now. So we have our powerlifting level one online, and I'll show you about that at the end. And I'll be having a discount with that too. So 
from an integrated stance standpoint for a deadlift, it's pretty simple. Uh, you can just do a wide and narrow hinge. So basically it's like doing a straight leg almost, and you just want to hinge down. And this, this picture is perfect. So this is Patrick. You'll notice the top picture, he's a little more narrow, more like conventional. And in the bottom picture, he's a little wider, which would be a little bit more like a sumo. When he goes wider, he does not have the same range of motion. He has less range of motion in a hinge position, which means that he's going to go lower. He's going to really have to dramatically change his, his positioning. And that may indicate that he has a limitation in that particular area. So if we started him right now in doing sumo, he would be, and to his point, he's already told me this, so you've seen it. He's, he would be weaker in the sumo than he would be in the conventional. It doesn't mean that can't change and you can't make that happen. As a matter of fact, if you know how to do mobility properly, which is a whole other webinar we'll get into, then you'll, you know that you can actually make this change fairly quick um, by getting muscles to activate that aren't necessarily turned off. So just do a hinge, hinging uh, with wide and narrow positioning because that Foot, foot position because that will help you get a quick indication. It's just an observation, it's a quick screen of what someone's capable of doing. So if one is a little easier than the other one, that might be where you want to stay. From an isolated standpoint, we can look at hip flexion, both in a straight and then from uh, more of a wide, as you see in those two pictures. So we have the hip externally rotated and we have it in more of a neutral position, as well as the internal and external rotation, which are the lower ones. So the lower left is internal rotation, the lower right is external rotation. Those will give us indication of how that hip moves and where it right now is gonna be more comfortable. Dorsiflexion will also play into that. And if we don't have the dorsiflexion picture, but you can simply sit in a chair with your knees at 90 degrees and then see how far you can lift your toes off the ground. If you can barely get them off, you don't have very good dorsiflexion. If you can get your toes off the ground pretty high without moving, then you have a, a fair about a fair bit of dorsiflexion. So if you or the lifter that you're working with has good external rotation, but poor internal rotation, then a wider stance is probably gonna feel more comfortable to you. So in the hip flexion, if you're able to go out easier than you're able to stay in, then that's saying that you, your body wants to go that way. If you can externally rotate, lower right picture, more than you can internally rotate, that's telling you the body likes to be kind of wide because it prefers external rotation. Uh, you'll hear, depending on how much you flip around through YouTube and Instagram, you hear that that's because of the change in the way that the hips are positioned relative to the, the pelvic bones or the acetabulum bones and how they're situated. That can be true, but that does not necessarily mean because you see that happening that somebody has this antiverted or retroverted position of the hips. That doesn't necessarily mean that. You don't know that until you can actually do far more testing. Um, sometimes, very often, people are limited in internal rotation because they just, the internal rotators are weak and they haven't been able to activate them and turn them on. So, that's for that. The, if, if you have good internal and external rotation and you have good dorsiflexion, then it becomes a preference. It's which one do you, do you want to do? Because you can actually do both of those. So, I'm, I'm one of those people who have fairly good internal and external rotation, and I can do about the same hip flexion in the knee straight or the knee sideways. So I can do whatever one I want because they both, my, my body feels good that way. However, for me, I feel stronger in the conventional than I do sumo. I do a lot of sumo. I just feel more natural when I'm in conventional. But that's only me. That has nothing to do with anybody, and it doesn't mean that you should do that. It's this has to be relative to you. So mobility assessments give you feedback about how the body's going to move. So that's telling you here's where your body is right now. Just know that you can make changes, and you can make them very quickly. And we'll talk about that in some webinars that will be coming down the line as we have our new readiness and recovery training course, which we go into detail on how we can do that and show you actual techniques and all that stuff. So mobility can change. You can change it fairly quickly and then be able to train it that way. So we want to know from a mobility standpoint, how does the body move 
but ultimately it's the feel and the preference that are going to determine what stance you should be using or you should have your people use. Just because you're a huge sumo person or a conventional person, if you're a coach or trainer, doesn't mean that they should do that because you do it. Make sure it's relative and specific to their body type and they feel it. So as a coach or a, or a trainer, you should be comfortable and at least be able to do both of those so you can help others do which one is best for them. Excellent. Okay, with the grip, this is where and how the hands are going to be placed. So again, finding the right grip and preference, uh, finding the right grip is going to be all about the preference and feel, and it's going to be trial and error. Some people may start a certain way and then they change as they go on. As you get stronger, as you get better strength, mobility, all those things can, can change as you go on. So where you start now, if, if, if you've lifted a lot, may be different than when you started. If you've never lifted, where you start now may change in the future. That's okay. It's just finding the right place to start and then finding out if you're going to change, why you change. So to this point, real quick, I want to throw in one more poll just to get some information. So how often do you deadlift right now? Is it weekly, monthly, not much, or I've never tried? Just give me a real quick feedback on how much you guys deadlift. Awesome. Beautiful, beautiful. Excellent. All right. So <clears throat> hopefully for the people who've never tried, this will help. And for people who've been deadlifting, because we got about 80% of you uh, deadlift weekly. That's fantastic. Matter of fact, I just had a great deadlift session this morning. So those of you that do a lot of deadlifting, I'm hoping some of this will help fill in maybe a few blanks or give you a little bit of information on how you can start at least addressing yours or maybe other people that you're working with a little bit more. All right, so let's go back to business. <laughs> okay, so we wanted to make sure it's trial and error because that's going to happen. So hand width is going to be dependent on style, as you tell. So how far your hands, and that's actually technically not the right way to say it. Your hand width is basically going to be about the same because you don't want it too far outside the shoulder width. If you get too far outside the shoulder width, you place a little bit more stress on the shoulder girdle as you're lifting than if you're in more of a balanced position right under it. So usually, depending on how wide or narrow your feet are in either stance, usually the arm position will be almost the same. You can see for me in the top left and the bottom left, my arm position is slightly wider in conventional than it is in the sumo, just because I get inside my knees versus outside my knees. So the, that'll again be a feel, how far out do you want to go, how far out your legs go or your feet go. Um, I know a lot of people who deadlift with really close feet. And I know from a conventional standpoint, and they feel much stronger with close feet than they do slightly wider feet. Uh, and then you'll see variations in how the width is for sumo, and then it's obviously dependent upon your legs as well and the strength that you have. And then hand position, again, that's going to be on the pre pre preference uh, because there's different hand positions. So let me just go back real quick. With the hand positions, realize that there's a few different hand positions that we have. So we have, you can do a double overhand grip, and there are people who still use that. I'm one of the over, I love the overhand grip more than I do over under. That's only me, that's my preference. I'm not a world champion either. So, and then there's the over under. Some people go left under, right over. Some people do it just the opposite, right under, left over. So those are the three basic ways, double, left, right. And that's gonna be a feel and preference. So figure out which one you like or which one the person that you're training uh, prefers. Now let's get into tension. This is perhaps once you've gotten your position down, this is arguably perhaps the most important aspect of performing any lift, any of the power lifts for that matter, uh, even in your, your Olympic weightlifting, but especially the deadlift, as the deadlift is a, is a massive total body exercise, which all the other power lifts are total body. Bench press is a total body lift and squat is a total body lift. But how we create tension 
will be extremely vital in order to get the bar to where we want it to go and to make sure that we have proper balance, stability, and leverage all pieced together. So here's a few simple techniques. Number one, it starts with the feet. So you wanna make sure that your feet are in the right position that we've already talked about, width and the angulation. Do you need them slightly out or slightly in? You're gonna hear all kinds of stuff. You have to figure out what works best for you based upon, or your client or athlete, based upon their body and their mobility, their ability level. So I'm a person who deadlifts with my feet straight when I go into conventional style. I always see as I get wider, toe them out. But I always use a corkscrew. The reason why when I conventionally deadlift, I go straight is because I like to what I call rip and rip, or you can put toes and twists. Whatever works for you. The bottom line is you're creating a corkscrewing mechanism. So you're taking your big toe, your little toe, and your heel, and you're slightly gripping, not trying to rip the floor up, but just slightly gripping, you're putting pressure in that. That pressure creates tension, and that tension from the big toe and the little toe especially are like fence posts. So your big toes and little toes are fence posts that create a stable foundation because all of that tissue that is connected to them runs all the way up to the head. So there are actual lines of, complete lines of myofascial tissue. We talk about this in, in the course as well. But these lines of tissue are one constant band of tissue that runs up through the body. So your body is connected from, from toes to nose and from head to feet in, in all directions. So the more we can get anchored at the foot and then we can, when you grip, you actually start creating tension and that tension goes through the arch. The arch runs up through the back, also up through the inside, which is into the deep level and deep core. So you have tissue in the deep core that you actually turn on by using the activation of your toes. Again, it's not hard. It's just enough to put pressure into the ground. So that starts that. And then when you cork through your feet, so if you're standing or if you're in a place where you can stand, just stand up. And what I do, just have you guys stand up if you can. Now that you're standing, before you do anything, just be loose. All right. Now just squat two or three times. Just kind of squat up and down. Okay. Now this time I want you to take your feet. Make sure you have a little bit of pressure in your big toe, your little toe, and your heel. So it's almost like you're just, just doing a little tiny eagle claw. You're just gripping the ground slightly. Now from that, all I want you to do is take your knees and you're gonna rotate your knees out. Grip, I call it grip, and then rip. So the feet should move, your knees just move out. Now I want you to squat three times. So just go down and squat with your tension as you've gripped and ripped in there. And then you should notice that there's an extreme difference because what you've done is you've activated the tissues all up through your body especially even though even though it's only from the lower limbs okay so that's why we do the corkscrew that sets the stage and the foundation to create tension in the body so the brain recognizes hey i am ready i'm locked up ready to rock and that's what it's going to do for you and then the next one is you engage because we're grabbing the bar you get to engage the mid back and the shoulders so your grip you can engage those shoulders and you want those shoulders to come back on you so as you're pulling the bar it's like you're trying to pull the bar into you you're pushing that chest out and you're making sure those shoulders engage so now with your feet there your shoulders engage your body's like woo so now it's really ready to get doing then when you take the slack out of the bar so just create slight tension in pulling up on the bar if you're competing you know do not lift the bar off the ground because that'll be a failed lift. So make sure you just, all you want to do is just, it's a little click where you just get the slack out of the bar. Now you're tight. And then the last thing you're going to do is bracing. And the bracing has multiple components to it. So the whole just inhaling doesn't work. Bracing should not be a crunch. Bracing should actually have, it's almost like a Kegel. So you have your deep stabilizing muscles when the feet are going. Now you can actually 
have deep stabilizing by just doing a, uh, it's like you're going to the bathroom and trying to stop. So you have inner, the inner musculature, the pelvic floor and the, the abdominal region, which is your transversus, those engage, that creates that internal belt. And then when you take a deep breath with the Valsalva maneuver, and then you create tension, what you're doing is creating tension down, not this way. If you go this way, if you're actually crunching, you're going into spinal flexion. So if you go into spinal flexion and then you drop your head and you go into spinal flexion more, you're, you're looking from a flexed back. And if you understand the research and have looked through that, if you're lifting from a, a flex position, that provides the more prime opportunity for you to have injury in the ligamentous or the discs of your back. That's why people a lot of times have back problems is because they're not doing the techniques they need to do to keep the body in the right position. So as you bring it's internal, so it's like you're stopping yourself from going to the bathroom, and then you take a breath, and then you're you're coming down straight, not crunching. It's straight because you should be using the whole trunk to stabilize the ribs on the pelvis. The deep one stabilizes the pelvis on the spine. The superficial bracing stabilizes the rib cage on the pelvis. So you have inner and outer. There's two components to it. Rarely are we taught that. That's creating your tension. So that in and of itself takes practice. So you don't want to practice that on the heaviest weight. You want to practice that on your light weight. So when you get to heavy weight, you're ready to go. Okay. So real quick summary. And then I'm going to take a real, a real quick break. Body-bar relationship, choose your style, sumo or conventional. Make sure the bar's over the feet, the shins are inclined, the hips are lower than the shoulders, you're in that neutral spine, to slightly extended, and keep those shoulders directly over the bar. Your stance, find the width and angle based on your mobility assessments, feel and preference. And the grip, find your hand width and position, it's going to be the, depending on the style and again your feeling preference. Tension we just talked about corkscrew, mid back, take slack out, brace. Okay. And with that, I'm just going to look at the, the questions real quick. I wanted to see if there's anybody who's had some questions. Would you deadlift with a wider grip if you are training for a snatch? Absolutely, you have to. So the, the question is so the snatch grip for those who don't know. Snatch is an Olympic lift that has a wide grip. And there are actual, so you can do clean and snatch deadlifts. Now, the, that's a little slightly different deadlift because you're going to do it more like you're doing the first two pulls. So off the floor and then the transition, I should say, in the Olympic lifts. So you're going you're gonna to have a little bit more curvature with the bar because you want it, you want it to be more like the uh, the, the Olympic lift itself. So yes, definitely use a wetter grip for that in that case, because those are fun. Do those a lot myself, and I love that because it's just a variation. So it's not that you can't do it wide, it's if you're really trying to hone in on it. Okay. Um, unfortunately, no, these slides will not be shared. Someone asked if, if they can do that. So um, they won't be shared, but this all, the, all this stuff will be in our online course which I highly recommend. Uh, so why do I can I place my hands just inside the grip? Mark an Olympic weightlifting bar, not a powerlifting bar. Can you explain why this is not recommended? Um, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is how does it feel for you and is it giving you the best mechanical advantage? So Daniel, you asked that question and that that's, where you place your hands shouldn't be relative to markings necessarily. Those markings are there as guides, but they're not there as absolutes. So where you place your hands is relative to what works best for you. Good question. Okay. How about a trap bar setup? Trap bar setup should be very similar. It's just the trap bar setup, your hands usually on the sides. So you, there are already handles there that you have. So the, the setup process is gonna be fairly the same. It's just the, the equipment you're using is slightly different. Same if you were using 
if you're using a landmine and you're coming from the side and doing a deadlift from the side, it's going to be slightly different. So maybe the hands a little bit, a little bit different, but as far as the, the rest of the body, it's about the same. I already talked a little bit about the thoracic spine, Bethany. I hope that helped. When should someone, someone use a lifting belt? Okay, great question. <laughs> lifting belt can provide some, it can provide some feedback for the body for a lot of people that helps them understand how to brace. So if you use, let me, let me talk about this real quick. If you're gonna use a weight belt, uh, and uh, we'll talk about this in the online course, there's a whole video. So I go through a whole video on this, on how to do the bracing, you run you through it, how the belt works. But when you're using a belt, you're gonna do that brace. So you're gonna inhale, exhale. As you exhale, then you wanna draw in or stop yourself from going to the bathroom, which is called a Kegel. When you do that, then you're gonna take a slight breath, not a deep, deep breath, but a slight breath, and then get your belt. So you put the belt on, but you still have room to inhale. What happens is people put their belt on super tight, but then they can't inhale fully. So if you can't inhale all the way, if you can't get a good deep breath, then you can't get enough pressure to go into your intra-abdominal cavity to create intra-abdominal pressure as good as you would want it to. So make sure there's enough room to take a deep breath. And then as you're bracing, you don't want to push out into your belt. You want to use the belt as a guide to your pull, and then you brace. So that all that belt is doing is pressing into you. It's not constricting you. And that's where people make a lot of mistakes is they'll actually use the belt too tight. So when should you use that? You should use that if you feel like you need it. I like people to start lifting without the belt to get used to the technique. And then as they start progressing and getting a little heavier, using a belt is okay, but you don't have to use it on every single rep, especially in your warm up sometime. Let the body get used to having some of its own strength and stability, but as you get heavier, you can use the belt because sometimes that helps people keep a little bit better form. And I'd rather people have proper form with assistance and some feedback than just being sloppy as they get heavy. So I hope that that helped. That was a great question. Thank you, Ricardo. All right, so let me get to the rest of this and I'll get to some of the questions. We don't have very much left. Okay. So let's get into the action. The action is simple, but still not just pure simple. It's stand up. We're standing up with the bar and ascending with the bar. However, there's two components of that. We're gonna push the feet into the ground, and then we're gonna extend the knees, and then we're gonna do the hip or hinge into the full upright position. So there's, there's three parts and two steps. And the key is we want to maintain the positioning that we've created in our setup phase. So when you set up, that should be maintained. So when you pull, shouldn't everything fall apart? You want to get all of your positioning, you want to get that tension, and then you want to maintain that and just stand with the bar in those three components into two parts. So here's what it looks like. First, it's like doing a leg press. So for the fitness enthusiasts that are on here, most people have seen a leg press. So in a leg press, you're seated and you usually have your hips flexed. And then all you're doing is you're straightening your knees. So you straighten the knees, you push the, the pad away from you, or you push yourself away from the platform, how it works. So when you deadlift, you wanna lift that bar off by straightening your knees. You'll notice from the picture on the left to the middle picture, my back doesn't change a whole lot. It still has an incline as I stand up. And I don't straighten my knees to a full lock position. I just straighten it to where I get the bar up to the knees. And then from there, you're gonna go into the hinge. So once I get the bar to the knees, then I'm gonna hinge. So the reason we wanna straighten the knees and not necessarily the hips all at the same time, even though depending on how fast you move, it'll look like it's happening at the same time. But it's technically not like a squat where everything's moving at the same time. This is a little bit more of a press hinge. And that's, we wanna, we wanna get the, the, the legs, out, the knees out of the way so we can bring the bar straight up. So if I have my knees bent, 
I want to make sure that I can straighten them to get the bar straight up, and then I can pull it up through the hip structure. By having a slight flexion in the knee, when I get to the knee, I can also now stand through my whole lower leg. So I can use some quad and hip and not put all the pressure on my hips and low back. So that's why there's a little bit of a two part. And again, make sure that trunk remains solid, chest upright, and that will help with that head position. So be careful about that head dropping down. Watch yourself or watch the clients you're working with with that head because that will change the rest of the spine. Lowering the body and get used to when you when you lower it, uh, depending on where you at, what you're doing and how you're doing. I know a lot of people just like to drop it, and that's great if you're doing concentric only. But if you're getting used to doing reps, make sure you go back the same way. So it's hinge, press, press, hinge, hinge, press. That's just a way to, to help get that, that movement ingrained into your, your body, that's all. And obviously control the bar down especially if you're competing, you gotta control the bar down anyway. Okay, so from a summary lift, we're just going up, make sure your core through, pushing through the feet, you're braced, remove the slack out of the bar, engage the shoulders, extend the knees, not all the way, until the barbell gets to your knees. Then you're gonna go through the hinge, okay? And bring it back down. So that's, that's, the, that's the deadlift, that's the skinny on the deadlift. Uh, real quick things, and I'll get to questions. So the next strength talk will be next month on the 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to go through the bench press. The also we have this course, uh, the whole deadlifting. I'm so sorry, the whole powerlifting level one course is online then. So if you just click on the QR code, go to courses in the U.S., click on that button. And then you'll see down there's the power lifting level one. You'll get a 25% discount if you use that code right there, Deadlift Webinar 24. And feel free to follow us on Instagram, Lego Education and at Lego Sport. Okay, beautiful. All right, let me get to some questions. Appreciate your guys' help. Um, let's see. Could you please also explain about the breathing during the ex exercise? Great. So breathing in a deadlift is, this is gonna depend on how heavy and how many reps. So if it's a max lift, then you're basically gonna inhale and you're gonna hold it when you get to the top. That's usually where a lot of people will exhale, just so you don't pass out and then bring it back down. If you're doing reps and it's not super heavy, then this, this is also going to have a little bit of a preference, but essentially you're going to inhale as you get to the bottom because you're going to want to brace again. So you're going to exhale at the top, inhale at the bottom, stand, exhale, inhale, top, or at the bottom, and then exhale back at the top. So essentially the simplest way is you're going to exhale at the bottom, exhale at the top, and then inhale as you get into the bottom so you can brace and stand back up. And that would be the, the easiest way for the breathing to take place. Does positioning vary for quick lifters? Uh, positioning can vary for quick lifters depending on all the equipment that they're using. So that's a great question. The, the generalities should be basically the same because it's still the same lifts, but there can be variances depending upon every person because everyone's gonna look different. So if those of you that have been to a competition, or watch competitions, you can see that each lifter looks different and how they get into their lift, especially for a deadlift. Some people are top down, so they get all situated and they get all stuck and then they go down and grab the bar and stand, and then some people will actually bottom up. So there's a couple of ways that people get set up. So yes, there's always variances and there's a lot of variables that go into variances. Thank you, Pat, for that. Does the sand? also depend on the height of the lifter absolutely so the biggest variables are the biggest variables will be the ratios between segments shin thigh trunk arms longer arms with the same body type is going to change the positioning so longer arms are always more beneficial because longer arms may not have to be as bent over shorter arms you have to bend over farther to get depending on your arm leg ratio 
So limb lengths will depend on, will, will make a big difference. The taller the person is can make a difference, but it's also dependent upon how long are their arms relative to their legs, because that'll change the, the hip positioning of that, of that particular person. But yes, just know the height as well as, and, and probably even a slightly more than height for most instances, it will be the ratios of the limbs. Does the stance place greater or lesser emphasis on varying parts of the body? Adductors, yes. Uh, thus leading to different performance outcomes for athletes. Yes, so Davis, this is what I was talking about with going sumo versus going conventional. So when you go sumo and you're in that bent over position, you're placing your adductors, especially the adductor magnus, and even in the uh, the, the medial hamstrings, you're placing those in an in, in a, almost a maximally limit, or, or for, for most people, um, maximal lengthened position, and then forcing them to work as hard as they can from that. That's one of the most difficult positions for muscles to be in. And that's why some people, it doesn't work as well. So again, anytime you change the position of a limb, you're gonna change the length tension relationship of the musculature, and that's gonna affect its ability to do it. Can someone get stronger doing that? Absolutely. So all you have to do is you just have to train it. But to start for some people, make sure it's within their general ability, which is gonna include their mobility. So that's a great question, Davis. Yes, it will matter. Can you talk about the hook grip? Yeah, it wasn't covered. I don't think, no, it wasn't covered. Yeah, so the hook grip, and this is used in powerlifting as well as in weightlifting. It's simply, if I have a bar, which I don't have a bar in here, but if I have a bar, I'm actually putting my thumb around the bar and then I'm putting my hands over my thumb. So instead of being just a full grip, I now have the thumb around the bar and then my fingers go over the bar. And that can actually take pressure off the forearm. And that's a great way when you get heavier, if you don't want to do over-unders. And even if you do over-unders, you can still do that. But that will place, just so you know, for those of you that have never done it, that will place a lot of pressure on your thumbs. And you don't know that until you actually do it. So you can more than welcome to grab it. I just, those of you who've never done it, just have a little bit of weight or even just the bar and just get used to placing the bar in your, in your palm, your thumb around the bar and your fingers over your thumb and start lifting that. As you get heavier, you'll see that there'll be a lot of wear and tear. That's why you see people sometimes take their thumb, especially in weightlifting. So that can, that can take a lot of, alleviate a lot of pressure off your forearms. So great one. Thanks, Kellen. Uh, in a regular CrossFit gym program, should sumo deadlift be included as part of strength training? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great that's up. That's up to you guys. Uh, for as a as a general rule of thumb, if you're not training for something specific, like you're going to be in a powerlifting competition and you're deadlifting and you're in a peak phase right before your competition, variety is the spice of life. The body loves variety. So I would always suggest if you're a fitness enthusiast, even if you're just a coach, if you're not, and even if you're competing, because even the, the best competitors, they will use both. It's just depending on where you're at in your program relative to your competitions, you're going to zero in on doing what you do, because obviously as you get in there, you want that reps and you want the body to train exactly how you would lift in a competition. But if you're not competing, and you're just training for life and you're just training and you want to get stronger, absolutely. Throw in the varieties, throw in different variations so it's not always the same thing for the body. Very good, very good, Julio. Uh, what is your take on using straps? Straps are great. Straps are just assistance and that can help you. If you only use straps, then I would say do some without straps just because you don't want certain areas of your body to start to weaken. So remember, anytime you alleviate pressure off of some areas of the body, uh, while it can be good because it can help them recover, but if you do it for too long and then you, you, you start to lose. So if you don't use it, you lose it. So just make sure that you have an appropriate amount of time with and without 
straps, but straps are just a, they're a great thing to have. And they actually can have huge benefit because they can help you maintain technique and get stronger, same with the belt. So if it's a wrist wrap, if it's a, if it's a strip, the wraps as well as the straps and belts, those things can all be fantastic. They all have a purpose and they all can be great for you. So I appreciate those questions, guys. If you've only been using trap bar to deadlift and you want to move to conventional, what percentage would you decrease your weight to accommodate on the new setup or would you decrease it at all? You know what, that's gonna be, that's gonna be a you thing. You're gonna have to feel for that um, because sometimes the trap bars will weigh 55 pounds instead of 45 of a regular bar like she wets or it's 25 kgs versus 20 kg. So the best thing to do is <clears throat> start at lightweight, see how it feels and then go up because it's always going to be about technique. So just go up to where you feel comfortable. Deadlift programming frequency, how often is recommended for a 50 year old? Uh, Non-athlete, but good amount of lifting experience. <clears throat> That's a great question. So I'm 58 years old and that depends on, it depends on all your variables. So one of the things we teach in our courses and that you'll see in this course that online is we go through and have what's called a daily uh, a, a readiness and well-being score. So every day I take myself through these four questions. I just want to know, uh, first off, how have I slept? Do I feel well-rested? And what's my physical body? What do I feel like physically? What's my mood and what's my nutrition and hydration been? I give myself a score based on that score. That lets me know how stressed I am and how much I should be doing in my training. Realize depending on how heavy you lift, the deadlift is, a 90% RM of a 1RM deadlift is going to be neurophysiologically more taxing on the body in most people most of the time than a squat or a bench or, or a curl because of the way that it's the way that you're holding the bar, gripping the bar, and doing those things. Okay, so the deadlift has neurophysiologically a little bit more stress and strain on the body, but that doesn't mean you can't do it three times a week. It just it will depend on how, how heavy you can go all three times a week. So you may have to do one day that's a little heavier, one day that's a little lighter. It depends on how much you want to do it. So it really comes down to what do you feel comfortable with, how do you respond after a deadlift session, whether it's light or whether it's heavy, and then that's how you can work it out. Those are great questions. I hope that answer is really quick, Nico, but that's a great question. And love to see it at that's golden agers are getting into the 50s now. All right, elaborate a little bit more on slacking the bar. <clears throat> okay, so taking slack out of the bar. So when you have a bar laying on the ground, if you go up to that bar, especially if it's not a Lego bar with Lego plates, I'm just saying, uh, you're gonna find a lot of times there's a lot of slack. The reason you want the slack out of the bar, the real subtle slack is because you have receptors in your body. When you're all tensed up and you're grabbing, your body is anticipating what that load is going to do. If you, if the first millimeter to three millimeters is nothing, then the body will almost relax and then all of a sudden it hits and it's like, oh my gosh, there was this load, I wasn't expecting that. Because your, recept your receptors in your body are so sensitive. So if you start to lift something, it's anticipating there's load because visually, your, your body sees that there's weight on the bar. So it's thinking, okay, I gotta lift something up. But if there's nothing when it happens, then your body will like shut down, but then it has to immediately kick back in. And if it doesn't, that's when people oftentimes get hurt. So creating or taking slack out of the bar means before you stand, you just lift that. Where if you grab the bar, if, I, if I'm in that position, I grab the bar and if I just it activate my shoulders and I pull them back, push my chest out, that actually will lift the bar enough to where you start, have, you'll have the bar in the hole of the weight and it'll come to the top of that, that hole in the weight, just so there's no space in between that. So when you pull, there's no lag time between when you start pulling and then all of a sudden you feel weight. So hopefully that makes sense. That's a very important factor and sometimes people just jerk stuff up but you're actually throwing your body off a little bit and that sometimes can backfire uh, depending on where you're at, especially when you get fatigued. Thanks for that, Bethany. Some people 
move, remove, choose when deadlifting, any advantage to that. It's a preference. So there's no there's no reason why you have to have shoes um, other than if it's a facility policy. And but if you've never done it, don't go out and try to max out. Get used to doing it without. Uh, so I wear I wear toe shoes, Vivo toe shoes, and or sometimes I'll wear a Vivo just minimalist shoe when I train. Uh, just because I have to have shoes in the gym, but you people wear socks. A lot of times they'll wear like a slipper in competitions. Um, there's there's no advantage other than if it allows you to feel your feet and use your feet and get pressure. Great question. I know it's 11 o'clock, so if some of you have to jump off, I totally get it. Uh, there's a few more questions, and I'll just go through and answer, and then we'll be done probably in the next five minutes or so. All right, in the first third of the lift, moving bars and knees, are you saying that hips should rise faster than the shoulders? No. So, or should the angle of the back from the hips to the shoulders remain the same until you clear the knees? Yes, the, the, the latter part on that one. So, Davis, when, you, when you're in that position, this is where I start, and I'm gonna straighten my knees. So my hip and shoulders should move together it's just my knees that are straightening if that makes sense excellent excellent point how do you go to deadlift with a client with very long legs and shorter trunk arms okay um this depending on how big the difference is first i'm going to know what is their hip flexion capability so how how are they able to move their hips so when they're standing and they go down if they can't get into a neutral spine when they have their hands on the bar then if from a conventional standpoint then i would try from a sumo standpoint can i get them in a sumo position and if that still doesn't work then what i would do is either lift off of blocks or use the rack, the safety bars on a rack, depending on what I have available to me. So I can raise the bar up slightly and bring the bar closer to them. So at least I can get them to start doing a little bit more of a dead lift and not put them in an overcompromised position. That, that was a great question. I hope that helped. Shoes are barefoot, already talked about that. Um, what's best? It's what works best for you. So that's a preference thing. It's not going to matter. Um, some people prefer prefer the barefoot because it, they don't necessarily slip or slide. Some people they'll slide in their shoe, depending on what shoe they have. Um, but you can still get the same the same feel for people when they're barefoot. Some people feel more confident in a shoe than barefoot, so it's whatever works. You have to try it and get a feel for it yourself. Good questions. What movement to do to increase your deadlift? deadlift <laughs> the deadlifts are going to help so obviously the hinging is going to help you can break the deadlift down so you can just do dance to the to the knee so just get used to pulling the bar from the floor to the knee floor to the knee and then you can pull the bar from the knee up the knee up and then you can even do from just below the knee to just above the knee so you can break into components and actually lift the deadlift that way but ultimately it's going to be doing the deadlift to help. The caveat being understanding their range of motion and what's not working and what is working. And again, I'm just pre, I'm trying to setting the stage for down the road. We're gonna have a little bit more, uh, more information around mobility because that's, that's an area that people really don't understand very well. So we'll get into some of that because we have our readiness and recovery training course out now. The online course will be out next month, and then that will detail how you can actually fix some people's problems or help them get into better situations to move better. Um, so I hope that helped. How often should you deadlift heavy? Is saying doing max three to five, three by five, once a week too much? Uh, you you don't need because the because of the the 
carry over in strength. Max strength lasts for a long time. So you don't need to train max weights more than once a week. And sometimes people won't do it more, they'll, they'll only do it once every two or three weeks. Uh, and sometimes people won't do it but once a month. So it just depends on how you want to do it and how you respond to it. But you definitely don't need to train deadlifts in a maximum situation um, in more than once a week. You don't have to. So, and sometimes doing it more would act, will actually create uh, less chance of recovery and that can set you up for potential injury or, or illness. And you just get sick. Good question, Adam. Uh, how much actual advantage getting shoes off provide? So we've talked about that barefoot thing. Appreciate the info and help for, okay, from the Bay Area. All right, well, Nico, glad you're from up here. Uh, those are, let me say, I got just a couple of questions. They're leaving, leaving. What do you think, what do you mean shoulder down? Please demonstrate. Shoulder down. I don't know what I said about shoulder down. It's, when you're getting your shoulders back, so you want them back. You don't want your, you don't want it, you don't want your shoulders up, and you don't want them forward. You want them back and down as you have that more in you, so that chest is coming out. So hope that helped. All right, that's the end. So we're going to stop here. I appreciate you guys staying over just a few minutes. You guys were fantastic. So I hope to see some of you. If you want to look at the bench press, we'll go through a similar thing with the bench press. Again, jump on and get that powerlifting course. This code uh, is only good till the end of the end of next month. So you want to make sure that you jump on and get all that because there's a whole lot more information that we go through in that particular course uh, other than just obviously the, the, power, the, the, the three power lifts. There's tons more stuff in there. Okay. Everybody, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your week and weekend. See you next time. Bye-bye.